See, Martin Heidegger, great uh, German philosopher, has this concept of throneness. And he talks about it at both the cultural level and the individual level. That each person and each epoch, I mean everything, you, when you find yourself, you'll find yourself having always already begun. You don't you know, you're not there from the bottom up. You don't, you don't get to be there before it begins and watch it begin. By the time you come to yourself, you're already implicated in a past. I think so many of these stories, these ancient stories, which, yes, I mean, I totally agree with the way that you're, you're criticizing this. I mean, dogmatic, ridiculous people have ruined what are ancient people's attempts to give sense and meaning to our lives by narrative and mythic symbols and instead they have literalized this and now think there was an actual place and all this kind of stuff but okay so we need to go back to the story let's go back to the story he says god you know he says don't eat off the stuff and they do and then they they their eyes open they realize that they're naked that they're different that they feel embarrassment and shame and then they go hide, right? And then God says, you know, where are you, right? And so I think the issues are, what is this tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, it's actually the tree of the knowledge of opposites. It's the tree of the knowledge of opposites. And opposites include non-being, that is the discovery of nothing, and nothing came with language. See, it, they bit off the tree of language, and language itself, see, this is, they didn't know what they had discovered, but they were in their narratives trying to account for what, what was it that happened to the human. Well, somehow it seemed like the human had deviated from the rest of the animal kingdom because it was somehow aware of the moral order of things that gets created by an organism that now can speak of what is and what is not. What is not includes possibilities. And as soon as you can deal with what possibly could be, now you're in a moral world. If the world just simply is what it is, but people couldn't ever imagine it to be otherwise. There would be no meaning, there would be no possibility, there would be no moral order to the world. The world is moral because it's infected with nothing. And that nothing comes in through language. Now it starts with the hortatory don't, the don't, the thou shalt nots, the not structure is part of the admonishment that is early language that then and this is all Kenneth Burke's work, you know, that then gets stabilized into the level that we could call the, you know, the is not in its proper use, where I can look around and I can say what is not the case. You know, I mean, I can, I can look at this object here and I can say, you know, that this is not, you know, an infinity of things. You know, there's all kinds of ways that I can get at that. But I can also talk about what not to do, what people ought not to be like, that whole realm. Now, the way that this relates to the question of the tree of immortality, the tree of life eternal, is that speech itself, again, is part of the same... It, it's the same tree. See, in some stories, you'll find that it's the, the fruit is on... the same fruit is on different sides of the tree. See, it's the same tree that has those fruits. See, I think you said it as two trees. We we could, we could haggle about that. I think some stories would say, no, it was actually the same tree, and that tree had two different fruits. One was the tree of uh, the, op the knowledge of opposites. The other was the tree of life eternal. And life eternal does not mean the afterlife, and like if somehow you get this magic seat. No, it's that the human, by having its eyes opened and by being aware of its own nakedness and somehow being able to relate to the cosmos in its eternity while being a finite being, that itself was his knowledge of opposites, but sublimated it becomes the realization that language itself is made in the image of eternity. Language has timelessness as part of its dimension. Words don't rot. The word pickle does not age in a way that if I set a pickle out on a counter, the, the pickle ages. It's subject to entropy. There are different experiences. See, now, in, in the ancient world, you want to, we want to understand the way that, you know, when a person died, 
they would be gone and yet the name for that person would still live on. And that experience, that phenomena of a timelessness or of a more than the change and flux of the world around them and all those experiences that language engendered, it not only released the human into the moral order of the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of opposites, but it also liberated human into humans into a taste for the eternal. I've shot lots of videos here on, you know, phantasmagorical bananas. I guess I'll post one up there before, you know, as maybe as a link. But I think the issue is that these are stories, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly to, you know, criticize those who who try to read these issues literally. But I think it's more fun for me. I think it's more interesting. And maybe I would ask you, what would be your interpretation? What could be the interpretation of these stories if we would ask, what were these early peoples trying to communicate to themselves by their narrative? How were they creating art forms which were their best attempts at self-understanding for the condition that they found themselves in? When they looked around at the rest of the animal world and their own relationship to it, I think, you know, now in modern biology we have notions of DNA and we can say that each organism has its own environment and we can understand biospheric complexity in a way that perhaps they couldn't. I think all they could see largely was the differences between humanity and the rest of the natural world. I think part of that has to do Again, it has to do with literacy. See, literacy is going to take us even further afield, and there's tons of videos on this, so much in, in Marshall McLuhan and the media ecology tradition that addresses exactly these issues. At any rate, uh, I really found uh, Angie's, uh, the Antitheist's video, to be very provocative. I, I would encourage people to it, go look at so many of those stories in the Bible and look at it as literature. Try to see this as art that is a form of catharsis as we attempt our own self-understanding. These are stories that are trying to help people come to terms with what it means to be human. And they need to be pruned from all the dogmatic ridiculousness, but we need to open up to history. The fact that we are historical beings and can learn from what were the greatest sources of wisdom in the ancient world, I think that's really important. It's not to be underestimated. Okay, hey, thanks. Bye-bye.